that. But here's the other thing. We may be in a 60-day escrow. Phase one's three weeks, okay? Environmental's three weeks. So you're doing a lot of things all at once, okay? But the way I write contracts, the way my company writes contracts is that we get the books and records, we get everything in no later than day five of opening escrow. And the way I write it is that due diligence does not start until I have you know, this laundry list of books and records that I want. Well, that gets the seller off their, their tush, right, to get you the information. And then what happens is, and, and if it comes to me, it's considered delivered, okay? So if it comes to me and I'm in New York for 10 days, I've eaten up 10 days of your due diligence if I don't get it to you. Now, fortunately, we have great assistance and other agents that would do that when I go to New York. But the point is, is that it's important that you start doing that. Now, as a company, we start scrubbing it as well. We invite you to all of our Google Docs so that you can scrub it right along with us or you can see our work, et cetera, et cetera, okay? One of the biggest things I see is that um, we ask for copies of all the leases in multifamily, right? And I get page one. What is that? We don't even know if it's a signed lease here, right? So we'll go right back to them and say, no, we only have page one. But once we start getting the what we call the documents in, then we're going to be sending you, along with the documents, what we call a receipt of documents. And the receipt of documents says, yeah, I got this, this, and this. Doesn't mean you know what to do with them, but I got this, this, and this. Triple nets, same way. Um, I did a doctor's office, a, a three tenanted building in Surprise, and we got the commercial leases in. Okay, commercial leases, 30 to 60 pages, not unusual, okay? And in doing so, when we got those 30 to 60 pages in, now I can promise you I can read a commercial lease, and I can probably hit the high points, but I am not qualified to read 60 pages of a lease, nor do I really want to. I'd rather watch the paint dry on the wall, okay? Because it's very boring, as far as I'm concerned. I'll go through and hit the high points for you. But the point is of that is that, um, I, I would encourage you to hire an attorney to read those leases. Make sure that the guarantees are signed correctly. Do you know that we are a community property state, right? And if a husband goes out and leases a building, okay, and the wife does not sign the lease guarantee, that guarantee is completely invalid in a court of law. Wouldn't you like to have a lease that's enforceable? This little three-tenanted building that I did in, in, in Surprise the attorney called me the next day because we sent the leases on a CD. We were back in CD in those days. And, and the, called me and said, you must have a draft of the lease. I go, why? And he goes, because it's not signed. So I called the listing agent, and she was also a CCIM, a very good agent. And I said, hey, Barb, the, uh, this lease on whatever the tenant was, it's not signed. Can you go back and check and make sure we got the right one? And she did, and she said, no, that's the right one. That lease had never been signed, and that tenant had been in there for eight months. Okay, Now, that was a benefit for us because we were able to tweak some of the language in the lease and get the tenant to sign it before close of escrow. How many have heard the word estoppel? Okay, Estoppels are usually prepared by your attorney, or sometimes title will provide one. Okay, Here's what an estoppel is. And, and they're not used in apartments, I'm going to tell you why in a minute, but they're used office, retail, things like that. So what, what happens there, when you do a commercial lease as a tenant, you agree to fill out any estoppels that the landlord sends you. And the landlord would send you what we call an estoppel, and all you do is fill out what your understanding is of your lease. If I buy a shopping center and it's got eight tenants in there, and I take over the shopping center next month, don't you think I don't want to start off fighting with my tenants because what the written lease is is not the same as what they understand their lease is? Okay? That's an estoppel. That's all it is. But in multifamily, if I created estoppels, and I get asked this once in a while, estoppels and take it out to the multifamily tenants, it's going to scare them. They don't know what it is. They're not going to sign it, and you may even have tenants just walk out of the building because they think it's something that they don't even know what it is. Can you use them in multifamily? Yes. Here's the other thing, your and this is kind of my point too, your commercial lender 
will require estoppels on triple nets in office buildings and things like that. Okay? And oftentimes in that case, the, um, uh, the bank will send their own estoppel over that needs to be done. Okay? So we're going forward now. Okay? So now we're ready to order our third parties. And your lender is going to dictate part of those. I'm not talking about your due diligence. I'm not talking about what you should do for your own peace of mind. I'm talking what the lender will require. They probably are going to require an Alta survey. Okay? And we can talk in a little while, and I'm sure we will have time to talk about an Alta survey. Um, that's a little bit different because you're going to hire a surveyor, okay, an engineer, who's going to interact with your title policy and the title company and the property to figure out what's on that property and what's not. That's not just lot lines. They may require just a regular survey. That's called a pen survey. A surveyor is going to go out and say, here's the corner here and here's the corner here. And that's okay, but what's in here you have no idea, right? That's the difference between the two. And the cost is sub substantially more for an Alta, okay? So the point of an Alta, it's for your peace of mind. It's so the bank knows what you own and nobody else owns anything on there. They don't have any easements. They don't have any right-of-ways unless it's part of the contract. I did a uh, building um, in Flagstaff, and here's the building. Great. Great income, great everything, right? But book, um, uh, Barnes & Noble was next door, and they paid the owner of the building $200 a month for the ability to have their people come and drive across one corner of the property. So that was an easement, but they paid for that easement. That's okay. You know, as long as we all know what it is, and all that is is bottom line, um, more money for the property, right? So the point is, now the third parties, and your bank's going to say we need an environmental, okay? Well, there's ways to order an envi environmental, and we're going we're gonna to help you source environmentals. The bank may have their own companies that they demand that you use. And that's just the difference in loans. But again, that comes with your what? Letter of interest. All of that will be on the letter of interest. Okay? And in addition to that, then there will be the appraisal. And like I said, it could be from 4000 to on up. It depends on the size of the property. Okay? A Walmart's appraisal, probably about $12,000. A, um, a small small strip mall, an apartment building, you know, $5,000, $4,000, okay? It's the difference, by the way, when we talk about buildings where the loan amount is under a million dollars. Those loans are the hardest loans to place in commercial that there are because lenders don't want a loan under a million dollars. It's very hard to find someone that can do the loan and so it limits us on the banks. Very much so. You get over a million dollars and the whole world opens up because then you have insurance companies that will be your lender. You have banks, you have REITs, you have, you have lots of other sources to go to for money. Okay? So, now we say we like this bank, we like the LOI. So you're going to sign it. Okay? I'm going to recommend highly, again, that you have an attorney involved in this process because he's going to look at that letter of interest and say, you know what, I want to see this in the letter. Or I want to see this in the letter. And you know what, that's his job. Okay? So he may tweak it. Now it's got to go back to the bank and they have to approve it. And it comes back to you. Now, now once you sign the letter of, it, of interest, now it goes back to the bank and the bank will send you what we call a letter of commitment, an LOC. And the LOC is your drop-dead terms of the loan. Okay? They've, they've, we don't have an appraisal yet. We don't have our third parties in. But the LOC, letter of commitment, you sign that and the bank signs that. Okay? When you sign the letter of commitment, be prepared to write a check or a wire for everything that the bank wants paid up front. Everything. Okay? The reason you want to make sure that you get an LOC signed correctly and that you've probably run it up the flagpole of your attorney is for the reason that when those loan documents come out, and again, I also recommend that you hire your attorney to read the loan documents. Because if those loan documents are not the same as your LOC, unless they've made a mistake and made it better than your LOC, you go back to them, your attorney probably would go back to them and say, hey, 
here's what you signed, you have to do this, and they can be made to do it, okay? And why would that be important? Um, what if they decided to give you a loan for 25 years and your loan docs came in at 20 years? Would that change your cash flow? Yep. Okay. And that does happen. We had um, a bank out of New York draw some loan docs and they sent the loan docs over and the, by the way, the banks do the deeds of trust and the deeds of trust can be from three or four pages up to 50, 60 pages, depends on the deal. But the deeds of trust, when they're drawn, okay, this bank in New York drew them, but they weren't state compliant. It was a New York bank drawing it, that's okay. But when they sent them to Arizona, they weren't compliant for Arizona. Don't you think you want an enforceable deed of trust, not only for the bank, but for yourself too? Yeah. You'll also, on the deeds of trust, you'll have what we call a schedule of rents. Okay. The bank owns those rents because they own the building, really. I know your name's on it, but they own the building. So if you start defaulting, they have the ability to come in and take the rents. They do. And not a lender in the world will, will do a uh, commercial loan without the uh, statement of rents on it. Okay. Now, do they run in? No, you got to work to get, you know, you, you start falling behind, and, and I hope none of you ever do, but you start falling behind. You're smart if you start interacting with a bank because they'll work with you to a point. Okay. So... Let's suppose that we have our LOC. What else happens in here? We brushed on it, but we have a couple of other things that will be here and here, okay? And it's called reserves, okay? Reserves, and you're gonna hear this. And what are reserves, okay? So you could have a roof re reserve. That, that's my Midwestern coming up, by the way. Or you could have a parking lot reserve, okay? And what they're going to do, the bank is going to require, let's say your payment is $1,000, okay? And you're going to have a reserve of $100 a month for parking lot and $100 a month for roof. The bank puts this in an escrow account. By the way, they will escrow taxes and insurance as well, okay? Which is pretty much like a residential loan. But on residential loans, you don't see the reserves. And what they do, they put that in an escrow account, just like they do for your taxes and insurance. Here's the kicker. Now you need a new roof. Maybe you've got, and, and it does happen, you'll have $20,000 in your roof um, account. Do you think they pay for the roof? No. You have to go out, do the roof, submit the invoices and, and the completed work to the bank. And here's what the bank does then. They send out someone to make sure it's been done. And that's probably going to be a $250 or $500 fee, depending on who they send and what they have to do. And again, all of that stuff will be in your letter of commitment as well. Okay? But they, it's an inspection fee. And they literally go out, they, they have people in every state or every city or whatever, and they hire them and they just go out and make sure the work's been done correctly. Again, why? They own the building, right? They own. 70% of the building or 62% of the building and they want to protect it. Here's the other thing that you want to look at in your letter of commitment and also your loan docs. You own this in an LLC, okay? And you want to sell it to somebody, but you want to sell your, your interest in the LLC to someone, okay? You can do that. That's another way to buy property. But in the loan, in the deed of trust, it will say that you can and, and this is very typical, that you can only sell 24% of the entity that owns the property. So you could not sell the entire LLC. You could sell a 24% interest in it. And that's, that's a very creative way. That's another dis a whole other discussion on how to buy properties this way. But you need to pay attention to that because what if you don't want to have that in there? You can negotiate that out maybe, and I say maybe on that because they're usually pretty tough on that. But if you negotiate that out, how are they going to penalize you for negotiating that out? They're going to raise your interest rate. But how do we get it back down? There's a couple of ways. Let's say that we're doing the loan with bank triple X. Okay? So if you have your rents deposited with that bank and you establish a banking relationship with that bank, they might knock off an eighth of a point, a 
that's typically what I see. Here's another way. You allow them to auto-debit your payments out of your account. You might save another eighth of a point. So now, an eighth and an eighth, yeah, I think that's a quarter of a point, right? Okay. So, there are ways that you can negotiate that, and again, that's your broker's job to do it prior to this. Okay. Now, what happens now? Let's suppose that the appraisal has been done, okay? And let's just pretend right now that it's come in just fine, okay? Your, your appraisal then, even though if it's hit your number, is going to go to an appraisal underwriting committee. And it's their job to tear it apart. And as brokers and as buyers, we're going to sit here, or even as sellers, we're going to sit here and twiddle our thumbs. The longest underwriting that I've ever seen has been three and a half weeks. It was abnormally long and it shouldn't have been that long. And if I had a better loan broker on that deal, my client insisted on using somebody in California who I had no idea who he was. And it got to the point that I had to call from everybody else's cell phone because he wouldn't take my calls anymore. Because I'm on him going, why don't I? I've never heard of an appraisal being in this loan. Here's what happened. He was afraid to pick up the phone and go, we're light on the appraisal. We knew that we were going to be light. We absolutely knew we were going to be light. The second that we found out, the listing agent when I worked, this particular one, worked together very closely. And he got on the phone to the seller, I got on the phone to the buyer, they met in the middle, and we closed within a week. Okay? But that three and a half weeks, the, the loan broker was worried about, oh my God, I'm going to lose this deal. Oh my God. Instead of picking up the phone, I'm the quarterback. Call me. Tell me what's going on. I would call him and say, I know we're going to be like, give me the number. I don't care what the number is. Give me a number. When he finally did, we had it resolved on an addendum within just a few days, and then we called for docs and we were done. Okay? So, communication again is key, and it's okay if the, it, any news is okay. Bad news, good news. You just got to know what you're dealing with, right? On anything. Life. 45 minutes to say. Okay. So, Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a little break now. Mike's going to shut off the video. Mike's going to shut off the video. Right now. <laughs> yeah. They'll, they'll edit that out later. <laughs> Let's take about a